Welcome back to California Edition. My name is Brad Pomerantz. I am honored to introduce you to California's Poet Laureate. Yes, he is a professor at UC Riverside. His name is Juan Felipe Herrera. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. I'm in the presence of greatness. <laughs> so I, am I. I, well, I don't know about that, but let's start from the beginning. By the way, uh, the professor will be reading some of his poetry for us. How did this happen? Well, you know, I just got a call one day. Come on. Really? I just got a call one day, and uh, it was the appointment office from the Gover Governor Brown's office. Sure. And they said, uh, well, look, you're, uh, you're at the top three. Three have been nominated by the California Arts Council. We're going to decide on one, so stay, stay on hold. Right. And how long before you got that call until you found out you had been selected? Probably like a week. And then I got the call, driving to from school. From whom? From uh, Terry uh, Holloman. Who is Terry Holloman? <laughs> who, who is this person? She's part of the uh, appointment staff for Governor Brown. What does this mean? Jeez, this means a dream come true. I step right. out of the dream into the dream of reality. Did and you ever dream that this could happen? Tell me about your background. No, I didn't. What's I, your background? My background is I'm a child of farm workers in California, and my background is... Were you, uh, what was your first language? Spanish. So think about this. Your first language was Spanish, yes. and you have been honored as a poet laureate in your second language. That's true. That's true. I'm spe I just got chills. I had never even thought of that. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. It's true. Okay, so what does it mean? Oh, it just means inspiration. Right. It means inspiration for uh, everyone. I want, to everyone, I want everyone to write, to express themselves, and to send me their poems. Is that true? That's, that's what you. That's, that, that's, what is your? What are your duties that's as poet true, laureate? That's true. Tell me what your duties are. Well, I got. I basically have two. One is to uh, have uh, six readings per year, urban and rural settings, and the other one is to come up with a project. And my project is going to be the biggest, and most incredible poem on unity in the world in California. I'm rendered speechless. <laughs> I literally am rendered speechless. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be quiet, and I'm going to ask you to read two or three poems. The okay. first one is called, Let Me Tell You What a Poem Brings. Thank you, thank you, yes. Let me tell you what a poem brings. Before you go further, let me tell you what a poem brings. First, you must know the secret. There is no poem to speak of. It is a way to attain a life without boundaries. Yes, it's that easy, a poem. Imagine me telling you this. Instead of going day to day against the razors, well, the judgments, all the tick-tock bronze, a leather jacket sizing you up, the fashion mall, for example. From the outside, you think you're being entertained. When you enter, things change. You get caught by surprise. Your mouth goes sour. You get thirsty. Your, leg, your legs grow cold, standing still in the middle of a storm. A poem, of course, is always open for business, too, except, as you can see, it isn't exactly business that pulls your spirit into the alarming waters. There you can bathe, you can play, you can even join in on the gossip. The mist, that is, the mist becomes central to your existence. What you've done for me is created war pictures. Through every word, a picture was being generated in my mind. And that's the power of word. That's the power of language. Uh, I'd like you to read another one for us. It's called La Placita. La Placita. I was remembering my father here. Mm. Every morning, my father walks with the rhyme, his shoes off beat, the hand-sewn patches of the heel. He goes after the fried potatoes in the black skillet, when I'm waiting in a dream, a yellow field without a name, and my mother is in half sleep, singing and preparing. There's a bench and there's a friend there. They talk and laugh and notice the fountain, tell its stories. This is how every day begins and ends at 82. The words aren't necessary. When he opens the doors, he gives my mother an odd roll of paper he found. He tells her about other days when he walked the same way in another country. When he talked to other friends in the same place, maybe Ciudad Juarez, 1956. The town is small, and sometimes when I pass through, you can hear the thousand tongues of the fountains. Birds make an incredible arc, a parabola without centuries, ciphers and cruelty, experiments. No one sees this, I know. They are living other lives in another time. 
Where do you get your inspiration? Uh, from everywhere. From everywhere. I used to wait for a moment and I used to kind of bottle it all up and, and then find a moment when it would just come out. Mm -hmm. And now really, it, it's all available. Creative forces and creative inspiration is everywhere. It's right here, it's on this book, it's in the people we meet, and leaves and trees and hummingbirds. So when you're speaking with your audience, when you're speaking with your students, yeah. when you're speaking with aspiring writers, mm -hmm. how do you imbue that inspiration? I am viewed by, uh, by being myself, by being sincere, by telling my story, and also by kind of uh, transmitting to them, letting them know that they are the, the authors. They are the authors. I, there's so much fear in a writing, in speaking in public. There is. And if you can just get beyond that fear and yes. just start, That's right. and just get pen to paper and go, I got to think, you know, writing in so many ways. I think in some ways more than conversing is cathartic. Yes, it is. You know, that there's something about, it, it's solitary, yet mm -hmm. it's, uni it's unifying. Yes. I want you to read another poem. I don't even know the <laughs> name yet. I'm just I'm, I'm mesmerized. So can you pick one for us? I'll pick one for you. Okay. Um, Do you write in Spanish, by the way? Uh, I write in Spanish, too. And that's, that's always a challenge. You know, I, I'm taking and Spanish I right now. I have my own uh, profesor, my maestro, and it is amazing what I've learned about the Spanish language. In some ways, it's a lot more descriptive. Um, there, the way that the, yeah. Span, the Spanish use the different verb tenses, so you can be more uh, specific about how the, the words you want to convey. Yes, it is. You know, there's more uh, more tonalities. You can right. play with more tenses. You ten, twelve I mean, tenses. Subjunctive oh. and, and imperfect. And yes. it really is, and it's frustrating as a learner of the language in his forties. But I do sense the richness of the Spanish yes. language that we don't have. That's good. So now English. you have. I'm trying. It's hard. <laughs> it is hard. My daughter speaks Spanish beautifully. They're uh, preteens, but it's a challenge. They're starting to write in Spanish, but forget about me. It's about you. <laughs> What's your last poem for us? It's called Yard Sale in mid-April, a briefcase where he stored grandfather's papers, an abacus, then a fake gold clock with two bells on its head, an odd barbecue for inside the house cooking, about the size of a three-layer cake, a pencil from Russia with a green tip for sketching. The sky is above all this, not in a religious sense. It notes this delight I take I take on rare occasions. Then it continues its own miracles. It does not matter that I am not seeing things, matter, space, future, spirit. All this does not matter. I step into the kitchen, give the abacus to my niece, tell my daughter about my cooking, wander outside under the clouds. It's interesting. People think about poems, they have to rhyme. Poems mm. don't need to rhyme. Mm. They kind of, they, you're right, they don't need to rhyme uh, in a typical manner. Right. But there's they, a rhythm. There's a rhythm, and the ideal rhyme is the rhyme between the poem and the reader, or in the person or the audience. And it's the kind heart, of, the, the heart. soul. It's an internal rhyme, you're right. So since you have been <laughs> selected, well, how has your life been turned upside down? Well, right now, I think it's the first upside down, and the first upside down right. is the media. Right. A lot of I calls. mean, you're here. <laughs> I mean, I've been trying to get you on the program for three months, Betty Miller, who's in our audience. You've been so busy, I couldn't get you on. Jeez. I know. But I, I'm Too just great. glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now, so, so it's been just a lot of attention. Yes, and then the audiences. Uh, they're, they're bigger, and they're more uh, into it. They're more excited. Right. More questions, more interviews. So right now it's kind of opening up the doors. It's like it's saying, Juan Felipe, we're going to open up the door. This is right. this is California. All of a sudden. And then I'm going to step into California. I'm going to visit more places, more schools, and more areas and more. Fifty-eight more. counties. Fifty-eight counties. You inspire me, and I am yes. so glad to have met you, sir. Thank His you. name is Juan Felipe Herrera. Thank you, he Brad. He is a professor at UC Riverside. He is California's poet laureate. I'm Brad Palmer, and uh, thank you for watching California Edition. Who is serving as the United States Poet Laureate for the 2012-2013 term? Ray Armentrout, Kay Ryan, Tracy K. Smith, or Natasha Trethewey? Emory University's Natasha Trethewey serves as the nation's Poet Laureate.
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Pomerantz. Our guest, Evelyn Essenwanger, she is a district attorney, deputy district attorney in Riverside County, and she is one of three coordinators of a unique program called Project Safe Neighborhoods. Before we talk about the program, which focuses on gangs and gang violence, could you give us a sense of the scope of the issue in Riverside County, the Inland Empire, California, whatever it may be? Surely, yes. Um, and I'll give you some statistics, Please. for example. Um, in eight years alone, between 1997 and the year 2005, there was 108 new gangs in the county of Riverside. Wow. And that total, 2,600 gang members to the numbers we already had before then. In only two years, and this is why this is so important, mm -hmm. in two years, between 2006 and 2007, 133 more gangs were added to those numbers for another 1,300 gang members. Why? And, and that is because of the growth in the, in the Riverside County. Is it pure population? It is has it demography? To... Is it tough? I mean, those weren't tough economic times. So... No, they were not. But I, what I do believe is, and some of this F FBI statistics show, that during that time, although California had a 10% population increase, 41% of that population came to Riverside County. It was a huge spike in population. I mean, this county, San Bernardino County, was booming in terms of the housing market. That is correct. We know it's been hit very dramatically by the fall. Um, I know those numbers are a few years old. Before we talk about this program, do you see the numbers dropping or well, I can Yes. Well, I can tell you that in 2010, there was 391 gangs in the county of Riverside. Okay. And although they have grown, they have they grow at a slower pace than other counties. For example, um, Los Angeles County has 68,000 gang members. It is stunning to think that there are so many gang members. Yes. And, and it's our, sad. Yes. In our neighboring city, San Bernardino County, for example, mm -hmm. they have over 40,000. During the same period of time, that Riverside County maintain the 13,000 members. So let's hope it's because of a program in which you coordinate called Project Safe Neighborhoods. Yes. Tell me about the program. Well, the program is an intervention and prevention program that we have here in Riverside County. And it was started by the Riverside County District Attorney. Right. And it was started because, as you know, we're a prosecutorial yes. entity. And, um, we put our thinking hats on, I would say, and that was because we wanted to see what other things we can do for our youth. And what's and, nice is, I mean, here you are, a deputy DA, a licensed attorney, and you are not spending much time at all in court because you are singularly focused on trying to improve the success rate of gang intervention. That is correct, and we start very young. Um, when we started back in 2006, we, we only reached out to high school students. But surprisingly enough, in asking those students after the presentations that we do, we realized that was too late to reach them. So we moved on to middle school. And surprisingly enough, now we're addressing students as early as fourth grade. I want to talk about parents. Yes. Because so often, parents are blamed if their children, their teenagers commit a bad act. Now, I'm sure there are some parents who deserve the blame, but your philosophy is not necessarily. Not necessarily. Because of the outside influences that our, our youth are presented with today or are exposed to today, a, a parent can do everything they can, and that does not guarantee that their son or daughter is not going to get invo involved in gangs or in the gang lifestyle. And, and let me ask you about yes. that lifestyle because I think it can be glamorized. And yes. what you do is you talk to these young minds and you explain the realities of gang membership. Yes, we go out to the schools and we um, bring two other presenters with us, um, it, uh, two ex-gang members, for example, and we tell the kids from a prosecutor's perspective because it's very difficult to talk to kids about gangs just if you're a gang member, but if you don't know nothing about prosecution and the harsh, con harsh consequences they're going to face should, should they choose to go down that road. And so it's because a prosecutor is telling them what is the, the consequence of the bad choices they make, I, I think is what you, makes a difference. A, a close friend of mine, her brother, when he was, I think, 18 years old, went to retaliate. Uh, he was in a gang and he was shot and the shot was perfect and it made him a quadriplegic. He spent 10 years in a home and he recently passed away. That is sad. I mean, if they could just see her face 
if they could have seen him in that wheelchair, it's, it's crushing. Well, and we, and we do have individuals like that that go with us as presenters. But I think what happens is after they, seen the present, they see the presentation, which is the gain awareness for the youth, mm -hmm. um, and they learn about the law and they learn about the harsh consequences, it brings it home to them. Um, we had a youth conference just a couple months ago, I want to say sometime in May, mm -hmm. and we had a young man from, San Fr from Sacramento They came up to us and says, I've had people talk to me. I have p people tell me how bad it is to be involved in gangs. However, after watching what to do, I am done with gangs. Really? And this is where, the, where we get our... So what are you doing right? I mean, like he said, he's heard from people. What, what's your recipe? What's your formula? We have six million homes watching right now. Well, you know, I think what helps is not a scare straight program. It's truth and reality. We really sit down and talk to these kids as a group. And we also allow them to ask questions. A couple, um, in the month of April, for example, I went to a continuation school. I did not know until afterwards, after the presentation, that most of the students in that room were gang members, but I did not know that. They were existing gang members. They were existing wow. gang members. And so I, present, I did a presentation to those students and I said to them, as a prosecutor, you were asked yourself, what am I doing here today? Because you don't wanna hear me. You don't wanna hear what I have to say. But I'm not here for every single one of you. I wish that at the end of the day, I can say every single one of you heard what I said. I have to ask, are you a Spanish speaker? Yes, I am. So I know that gang membership can be high amongst Latin populations, sadly. Yes. And I'm wondering, do you present in Spanish? Yes, we do. And is that that extra kick? I think it does, because I'll tell you what happens. A lot of time, um, Spanish families are um, a little bit naive to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Their kids might have kind of an upper hand on right. the parents. And so when I, they see a prosecutor, they come to them and talks in Spanish and say, listen, this is right. what you have, but this is what's going on with your son or daughter. They, it, it hits home, I think it really hits home because a lot of the gang members that are in prisons today are Hispanic men. Which is sad and it's not as a result of anything other than they got lost. They got lost and what happens with the kids, and this is what we have a parenting tip component to our program, where we meet with parents alone and we tell them the important, how important it is for them to really focus on their kids. Because if the kids are missing something at home, what's gonna happen is, is they're gonna go outside and look for they're it, which is a game. companionship. It's, yes. I mean, in so many ways, the gang leaders become older brothers, fathers. Become family members. We ask the kids in the presentation sometimes, why do you join a gang? Why is it that attracts you to the gang lifestyle? And they said, it's my family. And, and I, then I tell the parents, can you imagine how surprising that is that your son or daughter is saying that a gang member is a family member? When you're making your presentation, I'm sure that you look into the eyes of some of these children. What do you see? I see them lost. I see them lost. I see them yearning for information. I see them, they want somebody to help. They want somebody to reach out to them. Do you see a twinkle when the light bulb goes off? Do yes, you see it does. That? Yes, I do see that. And, and a lot of times we have answer and question time. Mm. But where I get the most joy is when I'll have a young man come <coughs> to me and mm. say, what you said today after listening to you today, I'm not going to do what I've been doing. I'm going to do something different. I had a young man, as we were saying, when I went to that. Um, the um, conference, the, the, the Sacramento. Yes, young. and and he said, and I, I was talking to him and saying, if one of you, only one of you can listen to me, I feel like I've won. And at the end of the conference, he comes to me and taps me on the shoulder and says, the I am the one, oh. I am the one. So that gives me- I start crying. It's very, yeah, it's, mm. it's rewarding mm. as a prosecutor to be able to see that you're going out in the community and you can make a difference. All I have to say is thank you. I mean, thank you thank so you much. Thank you for what you're doing for the children of Riverside County, the Inland Empire, California. It's such important work. Who would have thunk a law school graduate would be doing such great work thank and not you. standing in court? When we come back, we're going to be speaking with one of Evelyn's colleagues. Her name is Debbie Anderson. She uh, is operating the Family Justice Centers through Riverside County. I'm Brad Palmer. So we'll be right back on California Edition. Based upon a 2012 CDC report, how many California cities rank in the top five for the worst gang violence? Zero, two, three, or five? Three, Long Beach, Los Angeles, and Oakland rank in the top five cities for the worst gang violence. Also ranked in the top five are Newark and Oklahoma City. 
Welcome back to California Edition. I'm Brad Palmer and so glad you're with us today. We are joined by Debbie Anderson. She also works in the District Attorney's Office of Riverside County. She is a Victims Services Supervisor and Coordinator for Family Justice Centers. They sound like such an amazing place. They sound like oases. They Tell are. us about them. The Family Justice Center, the conception of it was a one-stop shop for crime victims. So they go to this facility and service providers go there to give the, vi the victims their services. It would prevent victims from going around to two or three different right. agencies and trying to locate where the services are. We're all under one roof. But let's talk about these victims because you really are looking at a subset of people who are victims in a way like none other. I mean, it's one thing to be a victim of a crime perpetrated by a stranger. Mm -hmm. Horrible, devastating. But when the perpetrator of that crime is a family member, right. there's a whole host of issues that get bottled up. Correct. And really unique circumstances for the victim and the service provider. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about your, your clients. Well, primarily they were started with domestic violence, so that would be any family violence. In Riverside County, we were big thinking, so we've expanded it to sexual assault, adult and child, physical child abuse, and elder abuse. So the dynamics that we're dealing with, if it's someone in the family, of course, a lot of times we have uncooperative victims at first. They don't want anything to happen to their family member. They're usually not the one that's called the police, or if they are, it may be a few days down the line and they're hesitant about you know, reliving what happened. So the advocates that work with them have to be really um, good at their interviewing skills and real empathetic to their situation, and they are. We, they all know about the cycle of violence and they're all trained um, domestic violence counselors, so they're very patient and we always say the victims may come to us more than one time, but you keep saying the same information. It may not be the first time or the tenth time, but one of those times it's going to click and we're going to be able to make some progress. So in Riverside County, there are two family justice centers right now. Currently operating. The good news is there will be another one yes. at the end of this year in Indio in the Coachella right. Valley. But let's talk about the two, okay. the two uh, locations that are Oasis for these families, one in Riverside, one in Murrieta. Right. When you walk in to a family justice center, what are you gonna see? Um, they're very welcoming environments. The lobbies look like living rooms. They're, uh, they call them soft interview rooms, so it's a friendly environment. So they're greeted by our um, clerical staff, and what they do is they're given a form to fill out, kind of a needs assessment, because we want to know the whole story about what we really can help them with. We're not really sure when they walk in what the situation is. Have they been referred? Yes. So it's bought, referred by law enforcement? Many are law enforcement, many are hospitals, schools oh, really? refer them. Oh, Some so people, that's... the courts, we get a lot of referrals from family law courts. So they can come from a variety of different okay, ways. Okay, so they walk in, it's right. a welcoming environment. Right. And they're greeted and then when they turn their paperwork in, a needs assessment will be done for by the advocate that will see them to see what really they're here for, whether they need a restraining order, whether they need to be relocated, do they have emergency needs of housing or food or clothing, things like that that are monetary needs. They kind of do a whole needs assessment like that. At the same time, they're doing a threat assessment to see what kind of danger they're actually in. You know, have they already been contacted by the police? Did they report the violence? We know where they actually are. Do they mm -hmm. need to go into a shelter? So it's a whole realm that we're looking at holistically. And so what happens? They've had the intake form, they filled it out, then what happens? Is there then another room that they go to, yes. a welcoming, yes. loving, support. Those are the little soft interview rooms and they're all set up and the victim will stay there with their children. We also have in both centers really nice children's rooms kind of adjacent to where they are so the kids will have a place to go play, watch videos, have toys and things like that while the, the parents are No, these are services. not residential facilities. No. But I would presume that through the intake it may be that you are making references yes. to residential facilities. Many times they need to be out of their situation immediately so we work hand in hand with our other community partners, the two shelters that we have in our county already. Mm -hmm. We work hand in hand with them and we have a referral source where we can get them. And when we think about domestic violence, mm -hmm. the first thing that comes to our mind is spousal abuse. Correct. But that's not only what you're focused upon. You're focused upon child abuse, mm -hmm. elder abuse, which to me is amongst the most deplorable right. around, right. especially when so many of these elderly individuals may have diminished capacity. And so talk to us about how you handle not so much the spousal abuse, because that it feels like we know what to do, mm -hmm. 
but the child abuse, the elder abuse. And you know, a lot of times with child abuse, we get referrals from Child Protective Services right. because many times the parents are the perpetrators. Exactly. So we have to tread a, a really a narrow path that we do with that. We don't deal with any defendants. So if the parents are the perpetrators or defendants, we don't have contact don't. with them. We deal with social workers. And we provide the same things for the children. If they need to get to counseling, we'll apply for victim's compensation for them. If they need to you know, have other services that CPS can't offer them, we'll see if right. we can find them. Are you making reference? to foster care if necessary. CPS does that part of it. But we're, you are we, the, the, middle, the, yes. the middle ground. We're the hand, we work hand in hand with all the community agencies. And as far as elder abuse, many times it's their caretakers or it could be a family member, their kids right. or, you know, that are taking care of them. So they're very hesitant to come forward and say anything. So each area has an advocate that works specifically with elder abuse. Even though the Desert One doesn't have a family justice center yet, we still have an elder abuse advocate. One would hope. I yes. mean, when you think about the Coachella Valley, yes. there's yes. a good number of elderly residents. Right. Um, I understand that in Riverside County, these centers only open in the last five, seven years. Correct. Is this a trend throughout the state of California? Are you aware? Yes, it was. Actually, um, San Diego was the very first one in California to open, and it went nationwide. They were on Oprah Winfrey show, and so oh, wow. they kind of like caught on about how important really the family violence was. And so um, we applied for a grant way back at the beginning um, in 2004. Sure. To, yeah, RD at the time, Grover Trask, we tried mm -hmm. to get a federal grant, and because San Diego was so close to Riverside County, we weren't given the grant. Oh, no. But he was committed to doing some progress, and you know, he said, we're going to go forward whether or not. So he put his money where his mouth was, and he thought even bigger than that, San Diego has one in the city of San Diego with one police department, and he wanted them regionally because we're so big. He wanted three, and we wanted to work with all the police agencies, sheriff's department, and all the city polices. So that was how we opened up the, uh, the first River one, Riverside in March of 2005. Right. And it, Riverside Police Department has staff in there with us, the Detective Bureau, the, since day the one. The city. The city police. What about county? We at one time had sheriff's department in there with us. They're no longer housed there all the time, but they can come into the facility and do their interviews and things and like that. And then in Murrieta, same situation? Same things, yeah. We have had sheriff's department out there, and actually sheriff's department is a partner out there. They um, have a grant now where they do have one sheriff's detective in it. Now, advocate. how are you getting funding for the center in Indio? I mean, these are tough fiscal times. You know, it's coming. our DA is committed to, our new DA, Paul Zellerbach, he's committed right. to it also. And so we're finding ways to do with... Um, I'm not sure where the funding's coming, it's coming from, but it's coming. But I would also presume that in the end, of course, we're dealing with people, but I have to think there's some cost savings. I mean, if it is a right. one-stop shop like you described, right. it really will become more efficient. Well, and hopefully by us all being there working as a team with the victim, it's going to make some progress because the prosecution is very, very costly. Of course. You know, just the investigators going out and doing all their investigation and coming to our office having charges filed, and it's really expensive, so we can intervene it's going to be cost savings for everybody. And for better or for worse, you are serving thousands. Thousands. Talk to us about that. How many thousands per year, for example? In 2011, we served over 5,700 victims in just those two centers. I so mean, that, look, it, it's more than we want, but at least we know right. that there is somewhere that they can go right. where they will not feel intimidated by walking into a police station. It is a welcoming oasis. And what I really want to stress to everybody now that I'm going out in the community a lot doing this, I wanted to just let everybody know that we can help victims whether or not if the investigation is still ongoing, it's not completed, we can still help victims. Whether or not we have a suspect, many times in a sexual assault case for a, a rape case, we mm -hmm. don't have a suspect. We can still help that victim. Can you self-refer? Yes, you can. See, that's special, that if yes. you feel like you need support, yes. there's somewhere you can go. In our final moments, Debbie, what has this meant for you? I mean, it, you must go to sleep at night feeling really good. You know, this is a really, it, it is rewarding. Um, we don't do it for the personal satisfaction, but, still, but doing it all these years, you really know. People ask me all the time, how can you do this? It's so depressing. But you see the progress. Isn't it the reverse in it a way? Is. Sometimes you see like families get situated, they get their jobs, they're living on their own, they're happy, the kids are happy in school, doing well, and it's really rewarding. Debbie Anderson, you are one of the angels of oh, Riverside County. I thank you for joining us. She is the coordinator of Family Justice Centers run through the District Attorney's Office office of Riverside County. That's Paul Zellerbach. My name is Brad Palmer and thank you so much for watching Charter California Edition.